Welcome to the Culture of Healthcare, Quality Measurement and Improvement. This is Lecture C. The component the Culture of Healthcare addresses job expectations in healthcare settings. It discusses how care is organized within a practice setting, privacy laws, and professional and ethical issues encountered in the workplace. The objectives for quality measurement and improvement are to define healthcare quality and the major types of quality measures, structural, process, and outcome measures. Describe the current state of healthcare quality in the United States. Discuss the current healthcare quality measures used in various healthcare settings in the United States, including those required for the High Tech Meaningful Use Program. Describe the role of information technology in measuring and improving healthcare quality. Describe the results of current healthcare quality efforts in the United States. This lecture will discuss the role of information technology and informatics in quality measurement and improvement, as well as look at the results of current approaches, as well as discuss quality measurement. What is the role of information technology, or IT, and informatics? Clearly, quality improvement cannot be done without quality measurement, and measurement really cannot be done without the use of electronic systems to capture data. Of course, it goes beyond IT, and informatics can play a role, as demonstrated by some of the programs listed on this slide. Fowles recently published a series of case studies that demonstrated the real-world use for quality measurement and improvement. There are standards emerging for quality measures and their reporting. There is the Quality Reporting Document Architecture, or QUERTA, for quality reports, and more recently, the Hospital Quality Measures Format, abbreviated as HQMF, and also called eMeasures. There is also the Hospital Quality Measures Format, HQMF, for individual measures. E-measures are an effort to retool 113 quality measures that are easy to extract from electronic health records, EHR data, and easy to express in HQMF. They are listed at the website on this slide. There is some evidence that EHR use is associated with better quality, or at least better quality measures, in some settings, in particular, inpatient settings. One analysis looked at hospitals in the University Health Consortium, or UHC. This is a consortium of academic teaching hospitals. When they looked at sites that had achieved HIMSS, Healthcare Information and Management Systems Society Analytics Stage 4 or higher, EHR adoption that includes computerized physician order entry and clinical decision support, those institutions were found to have higher scores on quality measures. Another analysis comes from the magazine Hospitals and Health Networks, which produces an annual report of the 100 most wired hospitals in the United States. They found that those hospitals were more likely to have higher scores on certain quality measures. In outpatient settings, however, it is less clear. For example, a few studies have shown that the presence of an EHR did not correlate with better quality in treatment of diabetes measures and general ambulatory quality measures. However, it should be noted that the study by Romano was poorly designed and based on older data and systems. A more recent study with a targeted quality improvement approach embedded in the EHR did lead to better outcomes. Barron's advice is useful. Better quality is not automatic and requires substantial effort. Whether or not EHRs are associated with improved quality, it is clear that they can augment the data that is used in quality measures. In fact, it is really almost a requirement. There certainly is great value to the coded information that is in an EHR. One analysis by Tang and colleagues found that an EHR significantly improved the ability to assess diabetes quality measures. 
In addition, administrative, sometimes called claims data alone, is insufficient to calculate, for example, HEDIS, or healthcare effectiveness data and information set measures. Data from the EHR can improve the accuracy of calculating those HEDIS measures, as well as calculating things such as disease-specific mortality. However, the existence of an EHR does not necessarily mean there is quality data. A lot of data in the EHR is narrative text that is difficult to access and process. It has been shown in heart failure, for example, that there is some important data that becomes inaccessible because it is in clinical notes, yet these are needed to assess quality. One example of this is exclusion data for medications patients should be on, such as a beta blocker or an angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitor or ACE inhibitor. On the other hand, some data can be extracted by natural language processing techniques as effectively as manual abstraction in some areas, although there is no general ability to do natural language processing in every area. But in some areas, such as smoking cessation advice, the diabetic foot exam, and congestive heart failure, CHF, it is possible to create natural language processing systems that recognize data that can be used to feed quality measures. Next is a discussion of the results of current approaches to quality measurement and a review of research that has attempted to determine if better performance on quality measures, particularly process measures, leads to improved patient outcomes. It will be clear that there is evidence for and against, and other problems might arise from the current approaches to measure quality. The English Quality and Outcomes Framework is a pay-for-performance, P4P program, that ties 25% of the pay for general practitioners in England to their performance on 129 quality indicators. The initial assumption was that there would be about 75% achievement, but there actually has been about 97% achievement, which has ended up increasing the cost of the program because the targets for higher quality care were met by most physicians. Another finding is that most of the quality improvement occurred as the program was starting and has since leveled off. Of note is that one of the major unintended consequences of this program has been its excess focus on the EHR and all its prompts for quality measures. On a positive note, another study found that the quality gaps in care for more deprived areas has been reduced. So does better performance on process measures lead to better outcomes? Yes and no. Patients who choose a top-performing hospital or surgeon, one in the top quartile, have one-half the mortality of those who choose a hospital or surgeon in the lowest quartile. If a patient could make this choice, they would likely experience lower mortality. It has also been shown that participation in the Hospital Quality Alliance by hospitals is associated with lower mortality for myocardial infarction, MI, pneumonia, and CHF. In addition, it has been shown that adopting the leapfrog group practices is associated with better quality and lower mortality for acute MI. So there are some instances where better performance on quality measures leads to better outcomes. Unfortunately, the story does not end there. There are other studies that are negative. One, for example, found that across various quality process measures, hospitals could predict only small differences in mortality from MI, CHF, and pneumonia. Another study found that the measures for quality of care of CHF, developed by the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association, have little relationship to mortality or rehospitalization rates. Perhaps one of the most negative studies showed that hospitals that participated in a particular P4P &P quality effort did not produce an improved quality of care. The hospitals did not do any better in the quality measures, and of course, none of the patients had better outcomes. Other studies have been negative as well. 
in one, a smoking cessation quality metric did not correlate with actual smoking cessation. In another, a door-to-balloon measure for acute MI did not correlate with other quality measures or mortality. Finally, use of Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, heart failure measures has not been associated with better outcomes. Does public reporting have any effect on quality measures? There was a recent systematic review that looked at studies addressing this question and found that there was very little evidence of improved quality of care when the performance of a physician or hospital was publicly reported. Another study, however, did show that public reporting, when combined with P4P, improved performance and quality measures versus public reporting alone. Another study looked at general internists in the United States and assessed their views on approaches to quality. It found that many supported financial incentives for quality, although they had concerns for public reporting especially the impact that it would have on the incentive to care for patients who were sicker or had more complex medical conditions. More recently, studies have shown that public report cards in Canada did not improve indicators for MI or heart failure, and that patients have difficulty understanding such report cards, suggesting a better approach might consist of a framework and plain language. The next topic will examine some of the challenges, limitations, and ethical issues in quality measurement and improvement. There are a number of challenges related to measurement of quality. One of these issues, for example, is in elderly patients who often have complex comorbidities with multiple diseases present. These may render recommendations and guidelines, which sometimes work their way into performance measures, as inappropriate. The UK P4P system, for example, allows exclusions based on various factors. One analysis addressed the issue whether this might result in practitioners trying to game the system by trying to get patients excluded when they should not be, and this was found not to be the case. Another issue is that the care of patients in Medicare tends to be dispersed among many physicians. A patient may have a primary care physician and then see a specialist affiliated with a different hospital. So it is difficult to attribute quality to a physician or hospital when the patient's care is shared by several practitioners. New results in clinical trials can render some measures obsolete. Given the recent changes in recommendations for lowering cholesterol and the treatment of diabetes, if the results from a clinical trial do not support the recommendations of current quality measures, then these measures can become obsolete. Some measures have unintended consequences. Robert Wachter, a well-known writer and quality expert, gives the somewhat funny, although concerning, example of patients who come into his hospital at the University of California, San Francisco, with CHF, and get treated with antibiotics inappropriately. Why do they get treated with antibiotics when they come in with CHF? When an acutely ill patient presents at the hospital, a clinician will first apply diagnostic efforts to determine whether the patient has pneumonia. The diagnosis of CHF is not always immediately clear, and the clinician may choose to observe the patient. However, some physicians may prescribe antibiotics to ensure that they meet the quality measure, only to discover later that the patient has CHF. It has also been shown that the multiplicity of measures leads to conflict reports, such as in stroke care. Additional analysis has found that most physicians do not have large enough practice caseloads to reliably measure differences. Berwick has suggested a need to focus on multiple measures and on all payers, not just Medicare or one insurer. There are also challenges for certain practice environments. Some of the measures have been configured, for example, such that the small numbers of patients in smaller hospitals can inflate performance relative to large hospitals. Measures need to be adjusted for different settings. 
It has also been shown that safety net hospitals typically have lower quality. However, these facilities that take care of patients who are poor or otherwise disadvantaged from a socioeconomic perspective provide a vital public function. They are, after all, safety net hospitals, where people can go for care when they may not have other options. In fact, the mission of these institutions could be adversely affected if tied into P for P, and this measure may actually worsen some of the healthcare disparities that these institutions are set up to address. Finally, small medical practices have challenges. These practices have limited time, multiple payers, and relatively small amounts of money for capital investment. One physician notes, is it becoming overly burdensome for some of these practices, particularly where he practices in Massachusetts, to be overwhelmed by all of these different quality measurements and other aspects of computerization of their practices? There are also some ethical issues for brief analysis. Further exploration of the papers listed on this slide is highly recommended for those seeking a deeper understanding of ethical issues. One issue concerns patient consent. When someone takes part in a research project, there is a process of protection for human subjects. This issue comes to the fore when a research project looking at the implementation of quality measures had not been properly vetted by the Institutional Review Board or the Human Subjects Committee to determine whether or not the research protocols were ethical. So a decision needs to be made on whether to treat quality interventions as part of patient care or as research. Lynn Snyder and Miller explore this issue and tend to advocate that it be viewed as part of care. There is also the issue of who pays for preventable complications. It is advocated that the patient not be responsible. Of course, the challenge is the identification of truly preventable complications. It is obvious that an object left in a patient is a preventable complication, and most would agree that the organization should be penalized in some way. Other complications, however, are less obvious. When a patient gets pneumonia on a ventilator, is it because the patient was insufficiently suctioned, or improperly moved, or not put into isolation? It is less clear that that is truly a preventable complication, and the question of whether it should be paid for is a little murkier. There are also tensions with regards to quality issues. For example, customers and purchasers may have different priorities when it comes to quality measurement. Customers may want to see everything and have everything focused on their improved care. Purchasers may be more focused on the economic aspects. There is also tension between the desire to improve care and not always having knowledge of the best ways to accomplish this. There may also be tensions between a physician's internal motivations for their patients and P4P &P initiatives. One study fortunately found that the internal motivations of physicians were not adversely impacted in a P4P &P situation. Finally, how can a high-performance healthcare system be achieved? IOM, ONC, and others have talked of the need to build a learning healthcare system. Such a system requires an infrastructure, including informatics, to learn what works. This issue has also been addressed in a recent report by the Commonwealth Fund, an organization that has been measuring the quality problems in healthcare. They advocate that the high-performance healthcare system be guided by certain principles, detailed in their report and summarized on this slide. All patients should have access to care and information, but they should also be held accountable for that information and making appropriate decisions. The healthcare system then must provide coordination of care and take on this notion of continuous learning and improvement. Some have argued the value of focusing more on the value of care than its quality. This concludes Lecture C of Quality Measurement and Improvement. In summary, the lecture has shown that there is an important role for informatics and IT in helping to measure healthcare quality. 
The research to date on quality measurement and improvement efforts shows mixed results. There are also challenges in measuring quality, particularly in certain practice environments, as well as ethical issues to resolve. This concludes quality measurement and improvement. In summary, this lecture has discussed that there are three major types of healthcare quality measures, structural, process, and outcome measures. Many different instances of these healthcare quality measures are used in a variety of settings, from health plans to inpatient to outpatient, including those that are part of the high-tech meaningful use program. Information technology has an important role in measuring and improving healthcare quality. Finally, the results of current healthcare quality efforts in the United States show mixed successes and a number of challenges.